to our fifth of our six Naturalist Journeys presentations this year. Is anybody, or how many of you is this your first Naturalist Journeys presentation? All right, well welcome to our annual program. Uh, how many of you is this your second Naturalist Journeys of the year? Third. Fourth. Fifth. Wow. Sixth. <laughs> <laughs> Great, well welcome and, and welcome back. I have a cheat sheet to remember all the things I'm supposed to tell you before we kick things off. Um, uh, but uh, most importantly, or one of the very important things I have to tell you about is uh, thank you to our sponsors that make this possible to be um, a by donation public program every year. It's our 14th year of doing um, the Natural Experience presentation series. So thanks to Hunger Mountain Co-op and the Washington Electric Co-op for being our underwriting sponsors. Also thanks to Union Mutual for sponsoring um, this uh, couple of talks here. So, uh, and that's it. So um, we do all sorts of other things here at the Nature Center. Anybody for this, your first time at the Nature Center? Okay. Great, welcome. Um, so we do all sorts of things here. Um, lots of other programs I could talk to you for the next hour just about all the stuff we have coming up between now and the end of spring. So instead of that, just grab the calendar and everybody out the door and come back and join us for the birding walk or come to Panama with us or anything in between. So um, <laughs> with, uh, with that, I will um, uh, introduce Matt Peters. Um, I'm not gonna say much. I'm just gonna, just gonna throw, throw it over to okay. Matt. Okay, hey, Matt. <laughs> great. <laughs> Easy enough. Thank you, Sean. Uh, get started here. Uh, thanks everyone for coming tonight. Um, I also wanna uh, throw out a special thanks to uh, members of the Upper, uh, Upper Winooski Field Naturalist Group that uh, graciously uh, decided to, to bring their meeting to us tonight rather than making me go and kind of do a replay for them over in Marshfield. Uh, it's, a, it's another great uh, naturalist group that we meet, meet monthly up at the Jacobs Library in Marshfield. Uh, and uh, if, if you want to get on an email list for that or anything, uh, find that guy over there, Charlie Cogbill, a venerable uh, historical ecologist. Uh, he's the, the keeper of the email list for, for our group. Um, and with that, I, I guess uh, by way of introducing myself a little bit, so uh, I work primarily as an independent botanist and ecologist. Uh, most of my work is uh, in Vermont, New Hampshire, and adjacent states, uh, and, and projects uh, basically uh, supporting biodiversity conservation in various ways. Um, but uh, over the last couple of years, I've had the, uh, the wonderful opportunity to uh, travel to this place that I'm going to share with you tonight, uh, Wapishka in north central Quebec. Um, uh, the, it, the, my travels there uh, with uh, my partner Sasha Peeler and our friends Bob and Kay Zeno here, who uh, I'll, I'll uh, throw them out there to help answer questions at the end or, or you can call them and so forth. Um, our, our, our travels there kind of began as uh, just uh, sort of recreational, exploratory. We've been up there twice now each of the last two summers uh, in early August. Uh, and then uh, after our first trip there, um, it, uh, I had sort of taken botanical notes and put just casually things I was seeing there. And uh, it turned out I uh, was seeing things that had never been documented there before. And so I realized there was an opportunity to make a, a real contribution to the knowledge of this place. Um, and, and so uh, coming out of that, I managed to secure a, a small grant. And that was kind of the basis for then going back with a more focused, uh, botanically oriented trip. Uh, and so we'll, I'll share some of that with you tonight. But I wanted to start actually with just like a little quickie uh, hand raising poll. Uh, how many folks have heard of Wapishka or the Mongruel, another name for this place, apart from in association with me or our travels? <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, I, don't, I see a couple hands, a couple hands, like three, three hands maybe? Uh, yeah, it's about what I expected. So not a well-known place by any means. Uh, but it's some place we should probably arguably all know about. It. Uh, it's uh, the largest alpine area, low latitude alpine area in northeastern North America. Um, and, and actually, uh, until a few years ago, I had not heard of this place either. Uh, I became aware of it actually through a, a great book, The Eastern Alpine Guide, that recently came out 
um, a couple, Mike Jones and Liz Wiley, uh, who are the founders of uh, Beyond Katahdin, which is a, a small uh, a nonprofit group focused on alpine conservation. Uh, they, they put out this great book, The Eastern Alpine Guide, that uh, I highly, highly recommend it, and it's kind of a, a mix of uh, natural history guide and conservation vision and a little bit of travel guide thrown in there as well. Um, so that's where I first learned about Wupishka. Uh, and uh, I guess um, from there, uh, you know, this, this just sort of unfolded. It, it took a couple of years of, of incubating, and then we kind of managed to, to, to get up there and explore and see the place for ourselves. And, and so I guess uh, with the talk tonight, my goals are, are you know, sort of uh, similar to the goals of their book in just uh, introducing people to places that aren't well known and at the same time connecting them to places like our own alpine areas here in New England that are close at hand. We, we already care about them and uh, you know, we need to, to sort of widen that sphere of, of knowledge and, uh, and concern so that we're, we uh, conserve these um, because they're, they're uh, really incredibly beautiful places, uh, wild, uh, diverse places, uh, and it, it would just be a, a tragedy to, to lose them. Um, oh, I just wanted to mention the name Wapishka. Uh, so like many of our alpine regions, this translates to basically white mountains, or mountains mm -hmm. always covered with snow. Uh, so uh, if you see some place called White Mountains, uh, you know, it could be one of, of many different alpine areas in northeastern North, North America. Uh, it, and uh, maybe, uh, so Wupishka is the Inu name for this region, uh, the sort of Anglo or, or uh, Quebecois name for the region is the Mont Rule, which refers to the whole area, not just a single mountain. So I'll, I'll probably end up mixing those two, so just understand I'm talking about the same place. Uh, so I, I thought I would start actually by uh, by sort of taking us on a tour through our New England alpine areas, or New England and, and New York, uh, North, northeastern US alpine areas, uh, just to uh, talk about some of the, the range of habitats, just uh, sort of bring these places up in our minds, uh, maybe touch on some of the uh, ecological processes that are happening, uh, and then you know, sort of we'll, we'll move on from there to Wupishka so we can kind of connect the dots and compare a little. So we'll start over in New York. New York has a small amount of alpine area uh, sprinkled amongst a bunch of uh, separate summits in the high peaks region of the Adirondacks. So this is just a, a view at the, the peaks known as the Gothics. Uh, you can't really see the alpine areas particularly uh, clearly here, but, uh, but uh, you'll see uh, features like some of these big slides here, just sort of indicative of the, uh, I guess, the, the extremeness of these uh, higher elevation alpine environments and some of the unusual physical processes that happen there and, and shape the landscape. Uh, jumping across the lake here to Mount Mansfield, of course, our principal alpine area. This is looking north at the Chin. Uh, you'll see uh, you know, the, the alpine vegetation is, uh, you know, it's largely restricted to the, the exposed summit ridge line. You've got uh, the montane forests creeping right up the sides, so you get kind of this mosaic, and there's, there's tons of bare ground, or, or rather bare rock there. Uh, and the, the purplish color in there, you can see this is a, a later season photo. Things, you know, the, the season is much shorter, of course, in these areas, so fall colors start to come on much earlier. Uh, we're, we'll, now we'll bounce over to New Hampshire to Maine briefly. Uh, of course, Maine's alpine is centered up in Katahdin, the Katahdin Massif in uh, uh, Baxter State Park. So this is looking into the North Basin, a uh, more remote part of, uh, of Katahdin, which has uh, it's a really wild area. Uh, down in the floor, this is a, a glacial cirque, uh, but down in the floor here, there's uh, something uh, referred to as an extinct rock glacier. I, I don't even know exactly what that is, but <laughs> it's just sort of uh, uh, indicative of some of the, the sort of strange things that happen in these alpine environments, things we don't find elsewhere on our landscape. Um, so uh, a couple other shots here from, uh, from Baxter and Katahdin. Uh, so it, it just really this uh, sheer, rugged, almost like falling apart, exfoliating rock. Uh, uh, very, uh, not a lot of vegetation there actually, a lot of lichen. Uh, we've got 
uh, subalpine ponds, tarns here, that's chimney pond, and uh, all the you know, all the cloud here and fog, a, a major feature of, of our alpine habitats that uh, both brings moisture as well as uh, damping down on temperature and light availability, which are of course very important for plant growth and what, what can survive there. Uh, last shot from Katahdin, uh, this is familiar, I think this is Hamlin Ridge over here. Uh, so there are, uh, it's not all sheer, there are sort of broad, uh, flatter tablelands kinds of areas. Uh, and this, whoops, uh, and uh, the sort of uh, alpine heath rush community that uh, one of our, our most typical uh, natural communities in, uh, in alpine areas here in New England. Uh, although this, this tawny looking stuff here is highland rush, a very common species up in our alpine zones. So then, uh, sort of the culmination of our uh, New England alpine areas, Mount Washington, the presidential range, of course. This is from the lower lakes of the clouds, uh, looking up at the summit of Mount Washington. Um, you know, tons of broken rock, basically, as this Felsenmere, they call it, this, this rock sea or fell field, it gets called. Very little vegetation uh, in much of those areas, other mosses and little things tucked among the crevices. Loads of lichens, of course. Uh, so uh, you know, there's still a lot of biodiversity there, but not necessarily the groups that we normally pay attention to more. Um, and and obviously aquatic habitats up in up in these alpine areas as well. Uh, reversing that perspective, so from Washington back down at at, uh, at lakes there, and this is uh, Mount Monroe. Again, all this fell field, broken rock dominating the landscape. Um, and oops, boy, mixing those up. And all this uh, sort of grassy-looking stuff everywhere. These these sedge meadows. It's not actually grass. Bigelow sedge, one of our most common alpine uh, plants, uh, forms these big uh, sedgy turfs, meadow-like uh, systems up there. Uh, and looking, that was southern uh, presidentials turning around. Uh, northern presidentials heading up. Uh, we've got Jefferson and Adams here, Madison uh, just peeking around the corner. Uh, more of the same in a way, uh, this Felsenmere, uh, Sedge Meadow areas, and then uh, you know, a little glimpse here into this, the terrain of the, the Great Gulf, one of many uh, big ravines that surround the mountain. And these are uh, a very different uh, habitat from the exposed ridgeline areas. There are greater snow accumulations, they're sheltered from the most extreme conditions, so you get a a bunch of species that grow there and not in other areas in the alpine zone. Uh, so look at uh, some of those things a little bit more. Alpine garden is a, a unique feature uh, sort of unto its own. Uh, in, in New Hampshire's alpine areas, you get uh, sort of their springs up here. So you get, this is uh, an area called Pinnacle Meadow above Huntington Ravine, uh, that it's this real, uh, real moist, saturated, rich uh, meadow. There's, there's some nutrient enrichment from all the meltwater that works its way down these slopes. So you get some uh, unique species that show up in places like that. Then dropping down into those gulfs, like the Great Gulf, only this is over in Oaks Gulf, we get, uh, you can see just in the color of the image, is very green, much lusher kind of setting. Uh, denser vegetation, a lot more species that can survive here because it gets protection from, uh, from those deep snow beds. Uh, another shot in there, just you know, that, that profusion of herbaceous plant growth, really lush stuff like uh, you know, the, the false hellebore here that we associate with lower elevation places, but it can survive way up high because it gets sheltered by the, the snow depth that piles up here in the winter. Um, but certainly other species that are distinctly alpine in nature and don't, don't occur in other places. So then jumping back up on top, uh, sort of a, a different kind of very relatively barren looking rocky habitat, much finer sort of gravelly substrate and, and weird soil processes. This is a little bit hard to see, but there are some uh, sort of longitudinal stripes you can almost make out in here a little bit. Uh, uh, there are soil stripes. There, there's all these sort of strange soil processes that have happened because of the freezing and thawing, the extreme freeze-thaw conditions that go on up in alpine zones. 
uh, things with names like solifluxion and cryoturbation and, and fun words like that. And I'd be remiss if I didn't throw in a, a winter shot in the Alpine, because uh, of course it's, it's cold and, and severe wintry conditions that are much of what uh, create the Alpine environment. Uh, this uh, is from uh, Madison, looking back at uh, Mount Washington uh, across the, the Great Gulf here in the middle here. Uh, snow depth, the accumulation of snow in varying depths and, or lack thereof where it's exposed by extreme winds. Actually, when I was putting these uh, slides together, it was a couple, some of them, uh, it was a couple weeks ago when then we had those really high winds mm -hmm. and there was wind speeds like 175 miles an hour up here kind of thing. It's like, you know, just amazing conditions up there and that's part of what, what shapes these places and makes them what they are. So, um, stepping back from the, the images uh, for a minute, I want to just sort of capture a sense of scale here quickly. So, so there's New York's alpine areas, about 100 acres sprinkled around a bunch of, um, uh, a bunch of different summits, about 20 different summits. There's Vermont, uh, we're at something like 116 acres, mostly on Mount Mansfield, a little bit over on Camel's Hump, a few more acres there. Then big jump up, now we're in Maine six and a half square miles of alpine terrain. Again, mostly on the Katahdin Massif and a little bit on the nearby Traveler's Range and some other summits in western and northern Maine. Uh, and I should say, this, the circles are proportional roughly to the area <laughs> involved, if that wasn't clear. Um, uh, New Hampshire, we're talking 10 square miles now. now. We're really getting up there. We've got double digits of square miles. Uh, and then we'll put all of New England and New York together. So this is all of our northeastern U.S. alpine areas. Rounding up, we're at about 17 square miles. So you can probably guess what's coming next, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is Wapishka. It's 1,200 square miles. This is like the size of Rhode Island, like literally. Um, so it's, it just completely blows out of the water what we have here in terms of scale. Not to by any means belittle what we have, uh, but it's just, it's kind of mind-boggling. And the, I mean, the, the title slide I started with, you get that sense of just, you know, seeing to, to infinity, to the horizon uh, in Alpine. Uh, so uh, that's where we're going. The largest area of uh, low-latitude Alpine ecosystems in uh, northeastern North America. So uh, here's the, the quick overview map, uh, courtesy of Google. So... Uh, from our place down here in South Woodbury, going about 700 miles north, northeast, across uh, the St. Lawrence, and then head up uh, the north coast, as they call it, of the St. Lawrence Seaway, across uh, the Saguenay Fjord there. Uh, yes, there, you don't have to go to Norway or Alaska <laughs> to see fjords, just go up to the Saguenay. Pretty cool, beluga whales and all kinds of neat stuff there. Uh, and then this right here where the line changes, that's Bay Como, a little uh, city on the coast. And then you, you head north on the, the highway to Labrador. There's pretty much only one road, so it's hard to go wrong. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's uh, Route 389. You go about 300 kilometers just due north, head on up there, and, and you get to this, uh, this crazy big uh, donut of a lake, a reservoir actually, which we'll talk more about in a minute. This is the Manicougan <coughs> Reservoir, the Manicougan Impact Crater. It's a huge meteorite crater that we'll touch more on in a minute. So we're uh, 51 and a half degrees latitude. So not, you know, not extreme. We're not north of the Arctic Circle or anything like that, but uh, getting Arctic conditions in, in the mountains. Uh, and I should point out, uh, you know, don't trust Google when you're going on trips like this. It's not that <laughs> accurate. Uh, it's not, not so bad, but you know, we, we took a day and a half to do the, the drive up there. Um, that's all I wanted there. So then just sort of big picture ecological context, we're kind of going into the heart of the boreal forest, which is this, uh, this huge circumboreal uh, band that kind of I mean, really circles the globe largely of dense black spruce dominated forest. Uh, and and Wupishka is, is basically right about where the sea in Quebec is there. So we're, we're towards the north edge of that band of boreal forest. Uh, and uh, they call it lichen woodland is sort of the next tier, the next lighter gray. So basically the forest starts to break up a little ways north of there. 
uh, sort of a, becoming savanna-like in structure, except with evergreens, of course. So, uh, so Wapishka rises as this island out of this sea of boreal forest. Um, boreal forest, you know, very dense, extremely mossy, I think moss-cloaked. Uh, you see similar forests in our mountains or some of our low, cold hollows, especially in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, but, uh, but nothing we have here in Vermont is really quite like the true boreal forest that's, that's black spruce dominated when you head up here. Uh, so there, here's a shot uh, up, up the highway to Labrador. Most of it at this point, uh, most of the southern section is actually paved. So it's not all gravel like this, but it's sort of like the Alaskan highway. It's sort of progressively become more and more paved through the years. But it's still a pretty uh, remote, rugged road to travel there. Uh, not a lot of services if you have problems, kind of thing. Um, and, you know, haul trucks full of logs and Hydro-Quebec uh, stuff and so forth going, going down here at high speed. Um, and I, uh, the power piece of this, much of the road, actually, there's a huge transmission power line corridors paralleling the road. And at one point, you pass this, you know, you're out seemingly in the wilderness on, I mean, on a road, but just wild land around you. And there's like this 10-acre substation kind of thing that just goes on and on and on with all manner of, of and, uh, electrical power stuff until eventually you get here, uh, the, the Barrage Daniel Johnson or the Manic Sink Dam, uh, which holds back the Manicouvin Reservoir, that huge donut-shaped uh, water body that we saw earlier. At one point, this was, I think, the largest dam of its type in the world. I'm not sure that it still holds that title, but, but it's pretty huge. Uh, so I, just to follow through with the, the impact crater and, and dam, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a bit of a cough, so apologies for hacking now and then here. Uh, so this thing is, it, it's like 60 miles across. It was formed about 215 million years ago when uh, basically a, a, apparently a, a comet broke up and various big chunks of it fell to Earth. A chunk that uh, made this crater that I think was about three miles wide um, blasted this out. Uh, the, the other craters are sort of, I think there are four other craters scattered around the world that if you sort of work the plate tectonics backwards, they all form a line. They don't in present, in our present globe, but. Um, anyway, uh, so that's, that's sort of the, the quick and dirty story of this crater, um, which then geologically is totally unrelated to the presence of the mountains of Wapishka being there, by the way. They just happen to be one right next to each other. Uh, and then uh, last time I was up in the shuttle, you know, I just snapped this photo. <laughs> you know, a NASA photo, obviously, and, and you can see the the crater right there, visible from outer space, with a little, you know, aurora borealis just shown it, thrown in for, for fun. Uh, you can see the, the lights of the north coast of the St. Lawrence down here. Uh, Hudson, I think that's Hudson Bay, not just clouds uh, back there. And you can't really make out Wapishka that clearly. It might be this white patch, but it's, it's about the size of that white patch anyway. Um, I'm not positive that that's it. So that, that uh, crater then, it, it had natural water bodies, but with the dam, it backed up, of course, and it formed the full, uh, sort of the full donut there. Um, 30, 33.5 cubic miles of water, uh, which by comparison, Lake Champlain is 6.2 cubic miles, so this thing is huge. Um, and, uh, you know. Might be where some of our electrons are coming from, you know. Hydro-Quebec supplies a lot of energy to New England. So anyway, uh, then continuing on a little bit further up the highway, you finally get to uh, the southern trailhead for Wupishka, which, which uh, uh, so Wupishka itself is, uh, is trailless, apart from basically two access trails that have been cut up to tree line. One, that we took at the south end that goes up to a mountain called Mount Provincher, and one that kind of uh, comes down uh, this way uh, from the north. Uh, but this whole interior area, these squiggles represent our, our roughly our two trips in 2017 and 2018. Um, and uh, the, the total 
sort of area that we covered was uh, sort of crisscross about 20 square miles worth of terrain over the course of those two trips. We'd, we'd hope to actually get like way over here, like much further uh, east, but it's just really slow going here. Um, got big packs, as you can see. Uh, and well, having a botanist along never helps because you just <laughs> kind of stop and look at everything. <laughs> So, uh, but I, you know, we, we found all kinds of cool stuff. So, uh, well worth it. Love to go back and, and explore even wilder parts or even further out. Uh, so, we got. Uh, I won't slaughter the French here, but if you can make that out, we got a, a, a territory of autonomy and discovery. You know, it captures it nicely right there. Uh, uh, so I think that's what I wanted to do there. Go. So a uh, little, little bit more overview. Uh, <coughs> so this is a, a topographic uh, sort of model or map. The green areas are the low elevations. The orange and, and darker colors progressively higher. So uh, you can see, again, you know, 1,200 square miles, roughly 25 miles by 60 miles in dimension there. And the, the crater, of course, is over here, uh, also about 60 miles across for perspective. Uh, so it's, it's kind of this, this broad plateau that rises from a uh, base elevation of about 1,300 feet in the green areas up to much of the plateau is around 3,000 feet or so. Uh, and then the highest summits, or the highest summit, singular, uh, Mont Verrier, over on the western edge here, is 3,623 feet. So, so not especially high by like the standards of Vermont mountains. But being this much further north and being east of Hudson Bay, you know, that, that's high enough to create alpine conditions. Uh, other things to point out here, so there's, uh, if you can make out this black line that kind of squiggles all around like that, uh, that's the boundary of this uh, Wapishka Provincial Biodiversity Reserve. Uh, so I don't know how familiar folks are with uh, designated reserves in Quebec. Um, uh, many of them don't provide perhaps, they don't provide the same kind of protections that we might think of as you know, a, a national park uh, and so forth. They have much more, uh, a different mosaic of, of land uses that go together. Biodiversity reserves, however, are kind of at the upper end of protections, uh, fortunately in this case. So, uh, so the designated area there, which you know, it encompasses you know, mm -hmm. maybe a, roughly a third or a little bit more than a third of the full Wapishka Massif, um, uh, that area is protected from industrial, uh, you know, e extractive uses, mining and commercial industrial logging, and, uh, and further hydro development, for example. Um, there's also a UNESCO World Biosphere Reserve site that's designated here that actually is much larger. It encompasses the, the crater, and there, there's actually an alpine uh, peak in the center of the crater that sort of uh, you know, the sort of inverted, I forget what you call it, but the ejecta that comes up after the impact crater is high enough to become alpine on its summit. So all of that is rolled into this Wapishka World Biosphere Reserve. So, oh, oh and uh, so the squiggles on the previous map, so that, that basically it was all within that blue circle there. So, so you know, we only sort of touched the tip of the iceberg here with our explorations. Yeah, this, uh, especially this eastern half, is, uh, there's a, there is actually a rail line that comes down this valley, uh, so that, that's a potential way of accessing it. But otherwise, there's, uh, you know, it's a heck of a long way on foot. Um, could get flown in, potentially, with a float plane, something like that. But, but uh, huge area. So then just uh, a brief geologic context here. Uh, so the whole colored area is Canadian Shield, the sort of uh, continental core of North America. Pishka right there is in this, this youngest province of the Canadian Shield, the Grenville province. So the shield has some of the oldest rocks in the world, over three billion years old, so like three quarters of the age of the Earth. Um, this youngest piece of it uh, is more like one billion years old, so still pretty darn old. Uh, <laughs> but uh, and then you'll notice. Uh, it swings down here and actually encompasses the Adirondacks right there. So geologically, the Adirondacks and Wapishka are related, uh, but not so with our other uh, New England alpine areas. Uh, the, the, the rocks here are, are predominantly these igneous, mafic igneous rocks. So 
uh, you know, they had their origins in magma uh, rather than being sedimentary or something like that. Uh, so uh, various types of gabbro, uh, diorite, and anorthosite. Uh, so anorthosite especially is a big player over in the Adirondacks. Uh, interesting thing about these rock types, uh, well, they're not something like limestone that you know, we associate with high levels of calcium and soil nutrients and so forth. Uh, they do have some potential for producing uh, enriched conditions that get botanists excited. <laughs> put it that way. They're associated with, uh, with increased levels of biodiversity or specialized plants that, can, uh, that need uh, more nutrient-rich conditions, especially mineral nutrients. Uh, so so that, it's tantalizing. There's, uh, I haven't found any fine-scale geologic mapping for this region, though. So in terms of like, going out in the field and trying to find something, uh, doesn't help. Uh, just uh, tantalizing, though. Uh, oh, I, I threw this in. This is a, a glacial striation that uh, we happen to see, you know, where a rock that was stuck in the bottom of the glacial ice dragged across the surface and gouged this in. Um, so kind of cool, but just uh, to remind me to briefly say, sort of, uh, the only thing I, I've uh, read about the sort of origin of the, the mountains themselves. Uh, of Wupishka is that essentially this igneous rock is, uh, is essentially harder, more resistant to weathering than the surrounding uh, metamorphic rocks. And so through uh, predominantly glacial processes, uh, we've been left with this uh, higher area than the surrounding terrain. So, so I think with that then, uh, if you'll bear with me for a little like botanical geeking out here for a moment, <laughs> a few slides. Uh, so as I said, our, our second expedition was botanically focused. I had this uh, grant from the New England Botanical Club to go up uh, and try to learn more about what's there. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, don't, the names obviously wouldn't mean anything to folks, but look at the dates. So the oldest one here, th and th this is pretty much like the catalog of almost everyone that's gone up there and done any kind of botanical work. Uh, so not that many, like 10 people or 10 groups for starters. And then the oldest ones, uh, 1964. For comparison, botanists were going up and publishing things about Mount Washington and the presidentials in the early 1800s, or even late, you know, 17, late 1790s. Uh, so, you know, it took a heck of a lot longer for anyone to get up here. Um, Oh, I think I forgot to say earlier. So it's only been uh, accessible by road since the late 1980s when they put in the, the highway up there basically to facilitate uh, big hydro developments and mining interests and things like that. But it, it did give us more access to this region. Um, and so <coughs> things sort of progressed slowly over the years and then sort of a flurry of activity here around 2009 that uh, that culminated in uh, this, this expedition by Flora Quebeca, which is the uh, Quebec Botanical Association, basically. This group of folks uh, headed up there, and uh, fortunately, they came back and actually compiled a report about all the things they'd seen. And they, they actually wrapped in some of the earlier observations from, from some of these guys. Uh, they had actually written up some of their work. Of course, the problem with all of this stuff is you know, if you look at these names, and. They're all French names, and <laughs> I don't read French, and so it, it uh, makes it a little bit harder to, to learn about what's going on. Uh, fortunately, Sasha does read French, speak French at least to some degree. Um, and also, fortunately, so I don't have to bug her all the time, there's this thing called Google Translate, which <laughs> you know, is, is not always reliable, but uh, it gets you there for the most part. Plus, Latin is still Latin, regardless of if it's in French or in English. <laughs> that that kind of works out. Um, so that, and the, the kind of just to, there's lots of different ways you can describe the botany of the region, but to just kind of try to quickly, succinctly encapsulate this. So their, Flora Quebeca folks, their list, they came up with 215 species of vascular plants that, uh, that were known to occur there, and then uh, this is uh, the Beyond Katahdin folks, Mike Jones and Liz Wiley. Uh, they, a couple of other published reports there uh, that bumped it up to about 218. Um, I don't know. Does that sound like a lot of species to you guys or, or not that many? And I wasn't sure how that would strike people. Yeah. It's, for being a, a, a boreal and alpine place, it's, it's not that bad, actually. You know, uh, um, it's a pretty good start. 
uh, I think for comparison, I've seen numbers for the uh, presidentials, they're kind of old numbers, but, but of, of more higher elevation restricted species, like well, truly alpine species, like 75, and then if you expand that range a little bit, it's like 175 species or something like that. So, so from that perspective, this is pretty good, but then we think about, you know, I can go out and survey, you know, maybe a, a 10 acre parcel that's got some habitat diversity, some woods, some fields, some wetlands, and get close to that if it's, you know, like around here kind of thing. So, uh, so in that perspective, a place of the size of Rhode Island, you would think would have a lot more than this number of species. Um, and, you know, as, as, as I found, uh, they do. Uh, so then just uh, those 218 break down into 100, about 130 genera and 53 families. So think about that, that's less than two species per genus and about four species per family, just sort of perspective on the diversity here. Uh, uh, so out of that group of species, there were several, five uh, provincially rare species that had been, that were known there. Uh, the, the first one there with the, the picture uh, might look familiar to gardeners here, ladies mantle, uh, a different species than what you grow in your garden. Uh, there are a number of them, but they, they are wild North American species. Uh, so uh, there's a, an alpine lady fern, looks very much like our common lady fern around here. Uh, Norwegian cudweed, that's this one here. Uh, orange agoceros, kind of looks like a dandelion. Um, uh, we didn't actually ever get to see that. And then glacial sedge, a nice alpine sedge. Uh, so that, I think, yeah. So, so that's basically the sort of, in a nutshell, the state of the botanical knowledge when we started going up and exploring. And so after a couple of years with some, uh, some focused work here, this is, will give you a real, quick sort of summary of where things are at. And, and this is certainly still a work in progress here. So, so I've personally observed uh, 208 different species well up there. Uh, and it turns out that 39 of those have, are newly documented for that whole region, which is like, OK, that doesn't happen to me every day. So, <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Um, and so that, that represents 16 new genera and four new families for this, this Rhode Island-sized alpine area. So that's pretty fun. And then uh, this winter, since we've been back and I've had some time, uh, I started combing through uh, digital herbaria, which, uh, so herbaria are basically the museum collections of plant specimens, dried pressed plant specimens, uh, um, sort of the gold standard for botanical documentation of, of things. Uh, uh, and they, you know, we've been compiling these for, for centuries now, really, in, in institutions around the world. But in recent years, uh, people have started to digitize these, essentially make databases of all those specimens so you don't have to actually go and look at that physical specimen at the herbarium to know something about what's there. Sometimes these have photos of the specimen, high resolution photos, sometimes not. Um, and there uh, sort of creates its own set of problems with sort of how much you trust the data you get from this. Uh, but uh, so these are uh, three digital herbaria that I've pulled data from to look at what, what occurs, what's been found up in Wupishka. Uh, and that has actually yielded 18 additional species that someone had collected, but uh, sort of had slipped through the cracks of the other reports and so forth. And some of that needs a little bit more verification. I haven't actually looked at those specimens in, in person uh, to you know, confirm identifications and so forth. But, but that brings our total up to 275 species or, or thereabouts. So, so that's a 26% increase in, in the, the plant species diversity there. So, so that's pretty exciting. Again, not something that happens every day for, for me. Uh, there aren't that many places uh, you know, in North America, I think, that you can go and, and do something like this. Uh, so, uh, so that's really exciting. Uh, as I say, still a work in progress, uh, trying, mostly trying to uh, sort of sift through those, uh, those herbarium records and figure out, sort of confirm for sure, which are, which are good, uh, and if any of them aren't. But a couple of other uh, perspectives here to, to summarize this stuff. So 32 of those uh, species, so that 275, so 11%, are not found anywhere in our northeastern US alpine areas. So uh, they just don't come this far south. Uh, an example of that group, so uh, the flip side of that is that almost 90% 
are in common with our alpine areas. So there is a huge amount of floristic similarity. Uh, but uh, as a representative of that group, uh, got pink elephants here, right? You can mm -hmm. see it. You know? you the, the nice trunk and the ears and the head. It's, this is a, a, a lousewort, elephant head lousewort, Pedicularis groenlandica. This photo actually is not from Wapishka. I took this out in the, the Beartooth Plateau out west. Uh, it, it does come further south out in, in the alpine areas of the western U.S., but not in the east here. Um, when I found it in Wapishka, it was uh, a little bit past, uh, but you can kind of see these purple stems here. That's it. Um, this is one that had actually been found back in the 80s uh, by Lavoie, but no one had seen it since and uh, found it there, but uh, although in a, a, di a different spot, so it occurs in at least a few places. Uh, and then I promise this is the only graph in the whole presentation. <laughs> it's a really simple graph. It's just uh, which of those uh, 275 species, uh, which uh, genera have the most species in them. So starting at the bottom here, Carex, that's the sedges. So sedges are the most diverse genus uh, in North America, <laughs> plants in, in North America as a whole. Um, and holds true up here, 31 species of sedges occur there. Uh, moving on up, Salix, that's the willows. So you've got a whole slew of willows, 18 species. Uh, a bunch of those are actually some of the specimen data that I'd like to be able to do a little bit more confirmation of. Some of them are, are you know, things from much higher Arctic that have been reported there, but, but willows can be tricky um, and, and, you know, uh, it would just be nice to be able to actually see some of those specimens. Uh, but a lot of them anyway, uh, vacciniums, the blueberries and cranberries, we get about uh, eight or so, and juncus are the rushes, we get six of those, and violets on top there. So those five genera together uh, are about a quarter of all of the species that occur up there. So just another way of trying to uh, encapsulate and, and describe some of the diversity there. Uh, oh, and a couple of the willows just for fun here. Uh, this one, uh, northern willow, just, you know, this is our trips from both in early August, the first week of August. And here it is. This is a, a male catkin with the red anthers. Uh, Little flies going crazy on there, nectaring, or I don't know, maybe they're, I don't know if they eat pollen as well. Um, willows are a great nectar source, actually. You might not think of it looking at them, but they have a lot of nectar in there. Uh, and just blooming in early August. Uh, and, this, and here, even further back, just emerging from bud, this was in a real a late lying snowbank area that had just melted out. Uh, there's a snowbed willow, another one that likes snowbeds, and just these little round leaves are the willow, and these tiny little red things are the catkins, and that's, that's all it is. It's itty bitty things. So, and then just one last piece uh, here. Um, so, we had the, the five rare species that were already known there, uh, and then this one, Alan's Buttercup, was uh, one that I found and got all excited about this. It was, I initially looked it up, and it was a, a globally uncommon species. It was Provincially, very, very rare. Uh, this is this uh, range map from the floor of North America. It's got a couple of patches of, of habitat here on the, the east coast of Hudson Bay and over here in the mountains of Labrador. And then just these couple outliers, including down here in, in the Gas Bay. Uh, and so there's, there's my dot there, the red one. Mm -hmm. and, and then it turns out they downlisted the darn thing. And it's like, you know, now it's only provincially uncommon. And, it's, uh, and which is, you know, it means it's doing, doing well. They found more populations is what that means, essentially. And they've, they've kind of filled in the range map here along the uh, northern coast of Ungava, basically. Uh, but still, it's a northeastern North American endemic species. It doesn't occur in other parts of the globe. So uh, I'd certainly never seen it before. So. That was a pretty exciting one to find, and, and uh, I'll show you the site that that came from later on. It's a pretty neat spot. So, uh, so that's sort of the, um, the botanical summary in a nutshell here. Now I, <coughs> I want to uh, take us through kind of a tour of some of the different uh, major habitats uh, and some of the plants associated with them. But, so I wanted to start with these, uh, these old growth subalpine white spruce woodlands. Uh, they're really cool. Uh, uh, habitat structure, very beautiful, basically this, this savanna-like structure, except with evergreens instead of, you know, oaks or something, we might imagine. Um, a lot of uh, 
a lot of uh, sort of scrubby uh, dwarf birch, a couple of different species. Uh, I think it's a mountain alder. Uh, and this is a pretty unique uh, type of forest or woodland system. Doesn't occur in other areas. Um, and there's, there's been some research that suggests, uh, if I get this right, so that about five to 9,000 years ago, there's this period called the Hypsothermal, where temperatures were actually a little bit warmer than today. And we had these forests uh, dominated by balsam fir uh, with white spruce in them. Uh, but then uh, subsequent cooling of the climate um, uh, basically <laughs> knocks out the balsam fir. White spruce is hardier than balsam fir. So the balsam fir can't hack it. White spruce is still standing there. And then you get uh, an increase in fire frequency in the surrounding landscape that, that shifts things in favor of black spruce, like we have in the current boreal forest as a dominant. Black spruce uh, uh, sort of has a cyclical fire dependency with big stand replacing fires. Uh, but it's too wet up here for black spruce to really become the dominant. And so the fires don't. Uh, don't persist. And so you're left with it's sort of like you, you subtract the balsam fir and the black spruce from the equation, and you're left with these white spruce that are the hardiest thing around. And so they, they form these beautiful trees. Uh, uh, old, maximum or the oldest ages are around 200 to 265 years. We saw some cut logs on the trail up, actually, that we were able to count. And they were, they were sort of in that range over 200 years. Um, so really neat system, and really they're just, I've got a few more images just to, to show visually, uh, just beautiful spaces, really. It's this, you know, the, the uh, sort of thing with savanna environments where it gives you this sense of, uh, of uh, you can see, but you can't see everything. So there's this kind of continuous unfolding as you move through the landscape of always something around the next corner to discover and, and see. That, just really, uh, they, they really struck me as gorgeous. This is a campsite uh, near Lac Magique. Uh, surrounded up, there are oftentimes patches of this woodland uh, associated with large lakes. Of a large lake we camped near Lac Joyel with this nice basin of white spruce woodland. Uh, beautiful terrain. Uh, shot in there, you know, so this sort of open woodland with uh, real brushy dwarf birches and so forth, lots of lichens, very lush and moist. Uh, very spongy ground everywhere there. In some places, it would come down to, uh, to streams. Uh, this is uh, towards the headwaters of the Riviera Tulmustuk. Uh, this was really fun, actually, not, not so much for the woodlands, but um, it was pretty warm this day. We'd been on a big hike. We came down here. It's sort of cooled off in the, in the river a little bit. And uh, so there's, there's bugs everywhere up here, of course, right? And I'll talk more about that later. But there was a lot of deer flies, actually. So we. We're catching deer flies and throwing them in the water to feed all these little alpine brookies that are that live in these streams. And they're like, they're not skittish about people or anything uh, like they tend to be here. Uh, and they they would just you know they're they're little guys too. They're they're just like that. They would just hammer deer fly after deer fly like oh, all you could feed them. It you know, sort of feels like uh, I don't know. <laughs> After all the pain inflicted by the bugs <laughs> on you, uh, <laughs> something that feels good about that, I guess. Uh, so anyway, so move, moving on, uh, moving up on up to the summit areas, uh, very exposed summits uh, were really the the uh, in some ways similar to our summit and ridgeline areas. Uh, many of the same vascular plant species, but but here it's it's actually lichens that really. Uh, that really dominate this system. It's the ground cover is like half lichen, really, um, and not not uh, crustose lichens that you see on rocks, but like reindeer lichen kind of stuff. Uh, tall, thick, big, thick mats of lichen. Uh, again, these summits are, are uh, like 33 to 3,600 feet. That kind of elevation range. Uh, some lower elevation areas that get really exposed, uh, and, and relative to our New England alpine areas, you know. There's not that much bare rock here, and there's, there's really none of that Felsenmere uh, or Fellfield type uh, environment. Um, I, didn't, I don't know why that is exactly, um, uh, but it's not there. Another conspicuous uh, absence was the, the Highland Rush that I mentioned in some of those early slides that's a dominant part of our alpine meadow habitats. Was, it, it's here, but it's extremely limited. Uh, 
very little of it to be found. Um, but otherwise, many of this, uh, the vascular plants you see there are, are the same. Um, uh, you'll notice the sort of socked in conditions, and, and this actually isn't bad. Sometimes it's much worse, like, you know, hardly see your hand in front of your face kind of thing. So it makes navigation interesting. We, you know, you see the, the map case there. We, uh, we had a GPS unit along. I, I used that especially for recording uh, uh, locational data of plant specimens, but we sort of elected uh, to do our navigation with map and compass rather than uh, doing it all GPS based. Uh, uh, and so that was a fun challenge and it gets more challenging when you can't see where you're going. So, anyway, and, and all you've got are 150,000 scale topo maps, which lack a lot of detail, like entire massive lakes just aren't there. And so, you know, it gets interesting. But there are a few other visuals here, just what this, these alpine uh, areas, or the, the most exposed uh, summit areas are like. Again, just all the light colored stuff. That's the reindeer lichen. Um, like actually, I think this, this lake back here, uh, just not on the map. Like, it's as big as other lakes that are on the map, but it just wasn't there. Uh, so you never know what you can find. So this is Mont Verrier. This is the, actually the, the tallest mountain in Wapishka, 3,623 feet. Uh, so again, this, this sea of lichen up here. Uh, so interesting, interesting things like it's a frost boil. So you've got these cryoturbation processes churning the soil and just you know, a random little pocket like this. Not a lot of this going on, but and why it happens right there, I, I couldn't say. Um, kind of a, a raised ring around it a little bit. Uh, cool mosses up here. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on non-vascular plants here, uh, but this was a really neat one, Rachometrium lanuginosum, that would just, it would almost be wind sculpted, you know, sort of like little waves here in these exposed summit areas. And then a close-up of, of the reindeer lichens here. Just a really neat feature here. You know, a whole other project to inventory lichens up in a place like this. Uh, very diverse, though. Uh, and then <coughs> reindeer lichens. <laughs> reindeer, caribou. Uh, so uh, there are caribou here. Unfortunately, we didn't get to see one. We, we really wanted to, of course. So instead, we saw caribou sign, like scat, uh, like antler rubs. This, this tree has been all stripped of bark and branches by the caribou. Uh, caribou trails, this, this trail worn in here at the passage of caribou. We saw this in a couple of places. Um, tracks, a lot of tracks, a uh, nice sequence here on a little gravelly substrate. They're very, very round. Um, you can distinguish them from like a moose track fairly readily, the much rounder kind of track. Uh, this is another caribou trail here. Uh, this is really cool, uh, uh, Mount Marjolaine, about a mile long ridge, and there's just this caribou trail that runs most of the length of the ridge. So we just kind of uh, walked that trail down the ridge line. It's pretty, pretty neat to be able to you know, follow a path like that that's just been worn into the landscape by these wild herds. Oh, they got the herds. Yeah. So, um, so I'm definitely not a caribou expert by any means. I've done a little bit of reading about this. Uh, and this, so it's woodland caribou down here. And it's, I guess, what's considered the, the boreal form or subspecies of the woodland caribou. So the taxonomy of caribou is messy and has changed over time. But uh, this uh, group is not the migratory herds that you hear about, like up the George herd and the George River herd and Leaf River herd that are you know, hundreds of thousands of animals, or at least once were. Um, they've declined as well. Uh, these herds, the, the numbers I've found are, are something like 3,000 animals across the entire range of that portion, you know, much larger area than just Wapishka. So you know, you're talking about very, very low densities of animals uh, in, this, in an area like this, unfortunately. And, you know, why that is exactly, I mean, it's, it's partly human use of the landscape, uh, potentially things like hunting, um, but also things like uh, climate change impacts and, and things like that. I don't think the, the story is fully understood. But, um, but uh, oh, and then since we didn't see any, uh, Sasha had to kind of uh, demonstrate here. It's uh, another antler rub here. She's <laughs> demonstrating the technique. <laughs> um, uh, 
But fortunately, um, others have been luckier than us in this regard. Uh, so this is uh, one of Mike Jones's photos. Uh, he's, uh, he's a great photographer, among other things. Uh, and it was actually a lot of their work up there was wildlife focused. They did a lot of camera trapping and so forth. But, uh, but he actually got to see this one, snap the images. Actually, you know, this was this great photo of all these, uh, all these, <laughs> <laughs> this guy's kind of in the way, but um, <laughs> the plants are cool, though. This is, this is Canada Burnett, um, a rare species here. It occurs along the West River in Vermont and, and not really many other places here. Uh, not, not rare there, although we didn't see it. It seems to be kind of restricted in Wapishka. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it just sort of, uh, I mean, gorgeous and, and just really, uh, sort of visually sums up the wildness of a place like this, uh, seeing amazing animals like that. Uh, so uh, a few other wildlife things. Uh, I, I wish I was a better bird photographer, but obviously <laughs> others in the room, John, uh, are, are uh, far superior to, to I in this. So this is a willow ptarmigan, something I'd never seen before, you know, a bird from, from higher latitudes. Um, uh, you know, in winter they turn pretty much pure white. Uh, summer they have this uh, two-toned kind of thing going on. Uh, there's another a little family group of them. The, the, I assume mother and, and four young ones here, and they they hang out in these summit areas. Uh, we didn't see a lot of them, but a few times. So that was pretty neat to see. Uh, and then other wildlife. So so Kay's pretty wild, but but not Kay. She's not the other wildlife. <laughs> You know, all those little things, you know. So, and, so the bugs are, are horrendous. Um, <laughs> and they, they inspire, you know, interesting, interesting <clears throat> styles like this and, and some antisocial <laughs> behavior, um, you know, and it's kind of understandable. <laughs> and I had Kay's permission to use these images. Um, you know, that, and it's a combination of black flies, mosquitoes, deer flies, and horse flies, kind of all at once, and no CMs, yeah, uh, all at once uh, in just numbers like you can't even imagine. I mean, I, I've. Oh, oh, we did, we did. Um, and that helps to a certain point. Um, they're pretty intense, though, and they're pretty good at getting you. I mean, I've, I've been a lot of buggy places, but this was just out of this world uh, kind of thing. Um, and yeah, head nets are good. Bug shirts are even better. Um, we also had a, an actual bug uh, a tarp mesh walled structure that like, gives you some refuge. Uh, in the evenings when you're in camp and that sort of thing. Really, it's about physical barriers as the first line, and then you know, maybe a little bit of uh, bug dope of one sort or another. Uh, but uh, I mean, they're serious here. I mean, uh, they could, I think they could inspire an allergic reaction, and you know, or possibly even just outright drain you of your blood if you don't <laughs> it adequate. It's, it's serious, for sure. Um, uh, and I, I'm not sure. That might be why Kay was icing her head here. I'm not sure, but uh, either that or she was just trying to, you know, get the first uh, first ever uh, headstand in a snowbank in in Who's the Pishka. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why you were. Uh, uh, I guess my animation didn't quite work here. Uh, uh, oh, sorry about that. Uh, this picture on top here is messing things up a little bit, but. Anyway, so I, I wanted to uh, <coughs> move on to snowbanks and, and uh, or snowbeds. Um, so in the New England Alpine, we tend to think of snowbeds, which unfortunately are here <coughs> here in this image a little bit, as these discrete features where the snow piles up really deep and it lies late on the landscape into the summer, and you get different species that occur there, and, and they're pretty restricted things. Uh, up here in Wupishka, it's like most of the landscape is like this. Uh, so it's very different in that regard. Um, and if the slide wasn't slightly messed up, you can see it a little bit better here. Uh, very lush uh, growth. There's like blue joint grass and raspberry and uh, mountain uh, goldenrod and all sorts of things in these places. Um, and this, in terms of uh, why this happens, this the slide on or photo on top here is not not so much a snowbank image, but you know, look at this this uh, little scrubby tree here. It's got this really nice, happy, lush part on the bottom. 
And then it's got this thing that just looks horrible. Um, and, and what this is telling you is that this is how deep the snow is, basically. Um, and this upper part gets just ice blasted all winter long and stripped down. Uh, and this one's pretty short, but in most places, or many places on the landscape where there were trees like this, it was, you know, that line was this high. So the whole landscape is blanketed in you know, six feet of snow for, for much of the winter, if not more, in many places. So that's why you've got this snowbed landscape thing going on. A couple more images of that again. Uh, just the lushness and greenness of this kind of shows you that snowbed character, especially areas like this and along this lake shore. Uh, they're just stopping for lunch there on a rock. Uh, another image here of Bob hiking through a recently melted out snowbed. So you see all this brownish vegetation that's last year's thatch. It's just melted out and hasn't greened up yet. Uh, kind of thing. So, and, a few uh, species from the, the snowbed kind of conditions, some familiar things. Uh, purple mountain heather, moss plant, couple uh, alpine snowbed specialties. Again, that, that snowbed willow we looked at earlier in here. This is a relative of our, uh, our dewberry or swamp. Uh, it's a raspberry type thing, but this, this is an arctic species that has uh, pink petals instead of white, like ours does. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, animals, we got the Hudson Bay toad that uh, I guess uh, has had various taxonomic status, statuses. Um, these days, I guess it's sort of relegated to just a, a color morph or variant of the American toad. It's, it's brighter uh, or orange and just strong contrast. They're beautiful and, and, and quite large. We saw them pretty commonly in these areas. And thanks to Thanks to Brian's uh, ID skills here, uh, I snapped the picture. He identified it, an Arctic fritillary. Um, did these get down to our alpine areas, Brian? They do, but they only do. in northern Maine. OK, that, yeah. That's at one site. Yeah, cool. So, um, but not, not, we didn't see a lot of butterflies, but um, uh, owing largely to conditions, probably. But uh, it's some nice things like that. And I think willow is among their host plants. I can't remember for sure. Yeah, it could, it could or the vi or the violet species. In oh, right. Yeah. Violet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Or a little. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, I, I looked it up and now I'm, it's escaping me. Uh, so a, a few of the the new species that I found, not new species, but new to newly known from here, uh, black sedge, a nice alpine sedge that uh, occurs here in Vermont. It's very rare. It occurs in. Uh, sort of limey subalpine cliffs here, uh, and oat grass uh, doesn't occur in New England. Uh, this is an interesting little uh, spike moss, a spore-producing plant. Uh, we don't have this here. Uh, other one, this is uh, alpine groundsel, a relative of the golden ragwort that you see uh, like in our fens and calcareous wetlands and so forth. This one's kind of uh, fun, false asphodel, uh, sort of a, a lily relative. Uh, species from higher latitudes, again, north coast and so forth. Uh, and then it's a dandelion. Um, <laughs> it's not the dandelions in your lawn, though. This is a, a native. Uh, there are a few uh, species of dandelions that are native to the Arctic uh, and higher latitudes. Uh, so uh, unlike the one, they're, they're actually having problems with dandelions in uh, snowbeds on Mount Washington right now. They've got, you know, sort of crews of volunteers uh, going and weeding them out of these sensitive <laughs> snowbed habitats because they are our, uh, you know, European species that's coming in and invading, unfortunately. But, but these are a native uh, dandelion. So uh, moving on into some, some uh, wetter uh, types of habitats. Uh, these cool uh, string fen habitats. So, you know, look, sort of looks like rice paddies or something, but it's entirely naturally formed. Uh, this forms sort of perpendicular to the direction of groundwater flow here. Um, they're often dominated by just a couple species of sedges, including this one, Carex raraflora, which uh, is known to occur in New England only on Mount Katahdin, but it apparently is missing, hasn't been seen for a long time, may have disappeared, I'm not sure. But it's, it's uh, quite common here, though, and points north as well. Was there a difference in elevation of the string fence? Yeah, they, they slowly step down. Yep, yep. Um, and you, 
most places we just small, saw small pockets like this. Uh, some places you get to uh, huge expanses of this kind of pattern of peatland type condition. Uh, neat. We don't, we don't really have this sort of thing here in Vermont at all. Um, uh, some other uh, well in habitats, uh, mm -hmm. alpine bogs here. Uh, oops. Oops. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Um, cotton grass meadows, there's like snow floating here. Um, and uh, especially in, in the alpine bogs, you get uh, cloud berries or baked apple berries, uh, raspberry relative. They, uh, they taste like baked apples, what can I say? They're, they're really great. Our first trip especially, we hit them just right for uh, their ripeness. So I can't say that this is really an ideal way to pick berries, like with a huge pack on your back. But, uh, you know, you take what you can get while you're out there. Uh, so it's, it was fun to have those. What am I doing here? I don't know, but there we go, onward. Uh, so uh, uh, just briefly, uh, aquatic habitats as well. There are uh, lakes and ponds of all varying sizes, big lakes all the way down to little, you know, almost vernal pool-like bedrock depressions in the most exposed alpine positions with shallower water and so forth. And these, these have their own uh, limited flora. Um, Course, but this is again uh, the Manicouagan Reservoir in the background here. Uh, so I won't go into a lot of detail there, but it's quite a wildlife kind of thing. Um, you know, we had uh, this, you can't quite make it out, but that's a beaver chewed uh, tree right up there, about five feet off the ground. So I figured that's got to be like giant place to see beavers. <laughs> in fact, I think, you know, this is probably snow way up here. And, when it came around and chewed this off or something. Um, but, uh, but certainly there we saw a beaver sign in many places on, on the landscape. Uh, there are these lovely uh, brook trout that I mentioned earlier. We did bring our fishing poles. Uh, they are, as I say, rather small. Uh, so it takes a few to, to make a meal. But I think the biggest one we caught was, what, like nine inches or something, seven or nine. Uh, but they're just, I mean, incredibly vividly colored. And, just amazing little fish up there. And they certainly have a lot to eat in terms of insects. Um, <laughs> you'd think they would be bigger based on the food supply. <laughs> uh, but they weren't. Uh, so then, uh, again, uh, thanks to Brian for the uh, photo ID here. Uh, another uh, species rare here in New England, right? Quite rare yeah. here. Uh, the ringed or, or lake emerald, we weren't quite sure just for my, uh, my uh, photo that lacks some key details here. But uh, uh, it was, was cold enough in the conditions there that morning that I could just pick it up. And of course, it's, it's hovering there to get going. Uh, but, but lots of dragonfly larvae in some of those pools. So sampling of some of the aquatic wildlife. And then, so those are all sort of uh, relatively widespread kinds of uh, uh, communities or habitats up here. Uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll uh, go through a couple of uh, very sort of specific sites. And in terms of finding you know, new plant species up there, uh, finding more restricted habitats was one of my goals, because they're more likely to have conditions that support new species kind of thing. Uh, but it, it's hard to pick out those places other than just kind of stumbling upon them. So this is uh, this, is this interesting uh, headwall uh, gully kind of system, uh, like the ravines or gulfs uh, uh, in the presidentials, only much smaller scale in this case. Um, but uh, so this picture is from uh, our first trip, 2017. And this is from this past summer. Uh, there's Sasha there for scale. Uh, and if you, you can match these up, actually. So this rock right here is this one right here. And if you look here, this white thing right there, that's one little chunk of ice left. This is the first week of August. Um, that was the only piece of ice or snow we saw that year. And then last summer, you know, the entire gully is still, we were basically there at the same time both years. The entire gully is still filled with snow. And this was really cool. It was also a little bit botanically disappointing to me because <laughs> this year I had like 15 minutes to poke my nose in here and go, oh my god, this place is amazing. And, and then we had to keep moving. So I really wanted to get back and, and see what all I could find here. Um, 
and, and we did do that, but obviously a lot of it's still buried under snow and ice, um, which was, was really neat to see in and of itself, you know. I mean, it's like if Session stayed there, you know, she wouldn't have even melted out by the following year. <laughs> so, uh, pretty interesting year-to-year -year variation. So uh, this is another shot for perspective, you know, we're talking 10, 20 feet of ice depth still laying there in that, that gully in, in early August. And a, a shot just from the top looking down. You've got that nice uh, sun-cupped, melted surface there. Um, really just a, a very uh, a exciting place, a botanical hotspot, as I said. Uh, despite being filled with ice here this year, did still manage to find a bunch of new things here. Some of them are, uh, are familiar from our, our head walls and gullies here in, in New England. Uh, so th this feature actually occurred on a mountain called Mount Obzuria. Uh, but I, I re actually realized just the other day, looking through all my um, botanical references and so forth, no one had actually ever documented Obzuria the plant from Wapishka. I just assumed, given the name of this mountain, that someone had found it there. And, and some geographer that was naming things must have known this plant. So I don't know how else that mountain would have come up with that name. <laughs> But lo and behold, Auxeria is there in this headwall gully. And, and we found it one other small headwall kind of spot. Um, it's certainly not a common plant up there at all. Uh, a relative of, of like your garden sorrel, French sorrel, has a tangy, tart, a lemony kind of leaf flavor if you, if you eat it. It's nice little pink fringed fruits. Uh, we've got an alpine bitter crest here. This shows up in, uh, over in Mount Washington, one of the few uh, brassica, mustard family plants up here. A little moss plant in the background there again. Over in this one, we've got uh, these little kind of star-shaped rosettes. That's an alpine cudweed. Um, it turned out to be a new species up here. That this also occurs uh, over on uh, Mount Washington very rarely. Uh, and this one, uh, kind of neat, a Sebaldia, uh, relatively abundant here in snow beds. Uh, only known from Mount Washington, Tuckerman Ravine, I think, in uh, in New Hampshire, um, but um, appears at this point to have been extirpated, unfortunately. And, and sadly, uh, historically at least, botanists were a big, probably a big part of that decline. There are a huge number of specimens of this plant from Mount Washington in herbaria, um, and now no one can find it anymore on and on. People know, knew the exact kind of spot it was last seen. Uh, a few decades ago, and they've gone back and looked, and not there anymore. And so we can hope that it's still there in the seed bank or some other uh, hidden nook or cranny. Uh, but uh, I think be one of I think it would be the first species lost from our Alpine New England Alpine areas in in recent history. Uh, so that's a little bit of a sad story. Uh, hopefully, not the last chapter in that story, though. Um, and and actually, the the folks from beyond Katahdin had had uh, spent some time up here studying populations of this species with the hopes of informing management here in New England, whether that's reintroduction or some kind of management at existing sites, just trying to learn more about what the species does in a place where you can, uh, don't have to be quite so worried about uh, your impact on it. Uh, so then uh, just briefly a few of the new species from this, this spot. Uh, we had a, a, an Arctic bluegrass, so like Kentucky bluegrass, but an Arctic species relative there. Uh, we had a, a northern anemone there in the middle. Uh, another, a different buttercup. So there's the Allen's buttercup I talked about earlier. Uh, that was in this gully. And then another buttercup that's also from kind of a similar kind of habitat distribution. I mean, that's my finger. Mm -hmm. Look how small that is. Um, this thing like, you know, melted out of that snowbank, you know, a week ago. And here it is already blooming like crazy. Um, it's really cool to find things like that, you know, and that's part of its unique adaptation here is to be able to do its whole life cycle in this really compressed period of time. Uh, a little uh, bearing chickweed here, uh, another species. That one I was actually hoping to get back, and I saw that in 2017, still under the snowbank last year when I was there, so I didn't get to see it again. Um, there, I'm, I'm actually trying to collect a specimen of one of these little guys, and it takes uh, fine work and you know, 
I'm going to be careful about that. And then the last shot was such a cool place. I couldn't resist throwing another one in, looking back up at that, that ravine. Uh, so then uh, last one of these kind of sites I wanted to touch on. Um, again, these, these kind of hot spot areas that I was hoping we would find things like this. Um, Bob is actually the first one that keyed in on this calcareous cliff. Um, and as I alluded to before, uh, calcareous settings get botanists excited because they have all kinds of special plant species associated with them. Uh, and, and actually, uh, we have calcareous cliffs in Vermont that are quite like this in flora. Many of the species are, are rare here in Vermont. Um, and many of the same species actually showed up on this one little patch. Basically, you see this, this orangish stuff right in these areas. It's a lichen called the elegant sunburst lichen. That's a vivid orange thing. It's a calcifile, so it's easier to zero in on visually. Um, and it, not, you know, not everywhere on this cliff, but this one little area, for some reason, either the mineralogy of the rock is different, or there's moisture, or you know, water flow concentrating things. And there is this whole profusion, and I forget uh, now, seven, six or seven different species that showed up there and nowhere else in all of our, our travels. So. A couple of those, white mountain saxifrage. Uh, it's white mountain saxifrage, not white mountain saxifrage. <laughs> it's a naming thing because there's a purple mountain saxifrage and a yellow mountain saxifrage as well. So it's one of those fun name things. Um, one of the, the little cliff ferns, a, a smooth cliff fern, woodsia, showed up there. Um, but uh, just a really neat spot. It uh, sort of encapsulates the, the feeling of discovery out there. Um, just another kind of overview shot of that cliff. Again, that, that real uh, calcareous spot was right in here. Um, and this was like pretty much the view from our campsite. Mm -hmm. um, and we didn't know this would be here. We just you know, had a big hunch from the topographic maps that there was some topography there. And, and uh, it's like, wow, uh, just sort of blew us away. So we enjoyed exploring there. <coughs> so, that's where I'm going to end with uh, sort of ecological explorations. Uh, I wanted to shift gears then and just talk briefly uh, a couple slides here about uh, sort of, um, I guess, our, our potential to impact this place by going here and our impacts in alpine places in general, uh, to kind of bring this back to the beginning. Uh, so this, this is one of our, our camps uh, by another lake, Lac Joyelle. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh. By chance, we happened to camp at this exact spot in both of our trips a year apart. Um, and it was actually, there's this thing right back here. It's actually an old stone fire ring that it was clear that oh, people had actually camped here before us as well. Um, so that was the only sign. And we were actually, I was kind of relieved when we got here the second year. Uh, we hadn't planned to come back to this spot. But I was relieved to see that actually, you know, you couldn't tell that we had been there a year before. I mean. I think we stayed there two nights the first time. But, um, but of course, uh, alpine areas, you know, well, the, the plants that live there are incredibly hardy to the environmental conditions. They're really vulnerable to, to trampling, really. They're, they just don't stand up to, uh, to uh, being walked on, essentially. You've got a lot of wet ground in this case. Uh, erosion happens really readily. Um, and, and uh, seeing a place like this, you know, in this huge landscape, we end up here twice. Someone else has obviously camped here before. You know, even though there's this huge landscape, people tend to gravitate towards small areas of that landscape. So even at relatively low levels of use, there's this potential to start impacting the place. And so finding the right, uh, uh, the right ways to uh, well, behave when you're there, and then from a larger perspective to manage uh, recreational use for a place like this. Uh, it may be hard to find those balances, but something that we need to think really carefully about. Um, and we, of course, tried to use uh, uh, leave no trace kind of uh, approach to our time there and, and minimizing our impacts. Um, and uh, I really hope we didn't leave much trace, although I have to admit, so this pole here, it was a dead down tree, but we, we needed it to be able to set up our our survival shelter here, the bug tarp. Um, and, and we had actually created this pole the first time that we went there and stashed it in a thicket back over here. And the first thing we did when we got to this site is Bob went over and went into the thicket and he's like, the pole! You know, so we could set up our bug shelter and 
So we, we did leave a trace, but it was just a, a stick that will, with some cut off branches that will uh, degrade, hopefully. Uh, but you know, some of the other traces that people leave behind are, are not so fleeting, perhaps. Uh, we didn't see a lot of evidence of other people. In fact, on our second trip, we didn't see anyone at all the entire week that we were out there. Um, but you would occasionally run across these kind of uh, campfire scars. You know, charcoal is the litter that lasts, as they say. You know, these things aren't going anywhere for a long time. That turf is not going to heal itself readily. Uh, and in other areas, you get, you know, this is actually the trail coming up, but it uh, only takes a little bit of hiker traffic, and those things get worn in, and the soil washes away as soon as the plants are gone. And once the soil's gone, then your prospects for recovery are just really, really reduced. So, um, you know, and that's, that's in this uh, incredibly wild, uh, otherwise trailless environment. Um, which is both a wonderful thing and a cause for concern, especially as uh, you know, burgeoning interest in recreational activities, and, and they're actively promoting recreational use of this area to some extent. A lot of that use is actually wintertime snowmobiling and, and skiing to some extent. But uh, uh, certainly summertime use has uh, high potential for impact with relatively low numbers of people being there. Uh, the bugs do offer some protection from, you know, <laughs> too many people coming there. But, um, and then, you know, it, so I, it's important to think about in really wild places like that. But this is Franconia Ridge, probably the most visited alpine place, certainly in the Northeast. Um, I don't know, maybe the world, I'm not sure. It gets huge amounts of hiker traffic uh, uh, doing the, the loop on Franconia Ridge, and you can see this really over-widened, uh, trail, uh, and, you know, it's, it's large enough you can see the trail running all the way down the ridge line. So, um, uh, you know, I just, uh, in bringing this up, I, you know, I just want to kind of connect the wild places to our alpine areas close to home and, and uh, emphasize our need to really steward these carefully and, and uh, make careful decisions about how we use them. Uh, because while they're, they're rugged in some ways, they're very sensitive in others. <coughs> And then uh, just the other big threat that I see to these places, you know, is, is of course climate change. I mean, these things are, are little islands perched on the top of our mountains and, and potentially can get just pushed right off the top. And, you know, this was not something I was expecting to be doing when we went up to Wukishka. You know, I did not think I would go swimming while I was there. Uh, biting insects aside, like temperature wise, <laughs> I did not think I would go swimming. But uh, this last summer, uh, we had days over 80 degrees up there. And while you know, I can't make any claims based on a single data point like that, um, it, it seemed aberrant to us. Um, I'm not sure, and it just uh, sort of to make the point that, that climate is a, is a very serious threat to these, or, or climate change, uh, human-induced. And we need to take that very seriously if we want these places to continue to exist and, and to do everything we can to, to combat that. So I think with that, I'll wrap things up. Uh, and have you take questions? We're going to throw out a few acknowledgments, certainly to my co-explorers here. Uh, and then uh, the Merhoff Botanical Fund of the New England Botanical Club uh, gave us uh, partial funding for this second uh, trip up there, the botanical uh, inventory of our, our exploration. Mike, Mike and Liz from Beyond Katahdin, um, both for their inspiration and for ongoing uh, sort of uh, encouragement and specimens. I just got a box of specimens from them the other day and, and things like that. Uh, and then local folks, Charlie over there, Brett Engstrom, Scott Bailey, Brian, uh, for, for contributions from uh, you know, lending floras to general encouragement, identification of various things, uh, and, and, uh, and, and sharing experiences in other wild places. So they've been an encouragement. Uh, Dominique there, uh, uh, my contact at the the Quebec Ministry with this extremely long name, <laughs> um, but they, they sanctioned our, our trip officially, and, and uh, I'll eventually be providing them information so that they can use that in their management of the region. Uh, and, and lastly, a shout out to Kay's Backcountry Meal Plans here for <laughs> keeping us well fed through the whole journey. Kay really spearheaded our, uh, our food and logistics for this trip. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions.
combination of conditions defines an outline an environment? Is it subjective? Or how do you know when you're there? Bugs. You know, well, <laughs> bugs, I like it. Um, well, I, I think you could look at that in, in a lot of different ways. And I mean, I, maybe I should defer your question to, to Charlie Cogbill over there, who's done <laughs> all kinds of research on uh, wh where tree line falls. Oftentimes, it's, it's defined by tree line, essentially the absence of trees. I'm getting a thumbs up or at least a thumbs sideways from Charlie. <laughs> but, where, but why does tree line fall where it does is the next question then. And, and is that climatically induced or is it because of uh, you know, soil limitations and things like that? Um, but uh, the first cut is really the absence of trees, I would say. Um, and, and you get into a gradation, obviously, with those white spruce woodlands um, that are sort of subalpine uh, in, in nature. But uh, yeah, does that, does that satisfy? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Do you know if those seven or 10 groups who've gone before you all have done the sample surveys, if they were in the same area or if they are in different regions of the? Yeah, to some extent, I know that. Uh, many of them were more or less in the same, or at least in the, the same set of western uh, hills or mountains that are the most accessible from the highway. Uh, certainly, most of the groups that have gone since the highway went in were on that west side. Um, some of the earliest groups, actually, though, did go further afield, including like uh, east of the, the rail line kind of gorge that goes down through the middle. Um, I, I'm not sure. They may have had uh, you know, air transport to get into some of those areas. I'm not sure how they got there. But uh, it, actually, it's, it's one of the uh, challenges of working with the digital herbarium data you can, um, they plot these things on a map, you know, a Google map kind of thing. You see, you know, this is where all the specimens came from. But, but then you start digging into it and you go, well, is that really where it came from? Or is that just where the coordinates ended up with, you know, from the, you know, the one or two decimal points of, of you know, uh, lat long coordinates? And so uh, it gets a little bit fuzzy in terms of where, where everyone has been. But, but yeah, there is some spread, but mostly it's on the west side, where, more or less where we were. So, you know, what else lies to the east out there? Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Now, why are some plants designated vascular? So, uh, yeah, sorry, I probably should have clarified that. So, uh, vascular, that uh, uh, refers to actually the presence of certain kinds of, of vascular tissue cells in their stems. So, but, but basically, the distinction between vascular and non vascular plants is, you know, leafy things versus mosses and liverworts. So non-vascular plants are mosses and liverworts. I'm sorry, I should have made that clear earlier. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Um, is there a history of indigenous people there? It's a great question. I wish I knew more about that. Um, you know, the, the name Wapishka is an Innu name. Um, that said, it's a little bit hard to imagine folks living here all year round, given the surrounding milder conditions. Uh, so um, uh, the real answer is, is I don't know uh, in terms of that cultural history. Um, obviously, an important piece in understanding a, a landscape like this. There are, um, there are still Innu trapping rights to some of this land base. Trapping what? Uh, I think mainly beaver. Um, and other other uh, fur-bearing, uh, you know, uh, species. There's uh, there are links up here. There's been research looking for wolverine up here. The Beyond Katahdin folks did a huge project around that with a lot of camera trapping. Never found one, but it's kind of like still possible. It's it's great habitat for them. Hopefully they'll come back if they're not there now. But yeah, yeah, it, it's a great question. I wish I knew more about that. Yeah, Alan. You mentioned the hypsothermal um, mm -hmm. where it was warmer. Yeah. And I guess it would be interesting to try to do like pollen samples in the lake beds or something yeah. to see what it was like then and maybe predict something about what's going to happen. Yeah, you know, and, and certainly that kind of work has been done in a lot of different places. I'm not, a, not, I'm not aware of it being done here. There, there I have read. Uh, there's a study that not looking at pollen so much. Well, no, pollen was part of it, but they uh, in they did sort of a, a thousand kilometer uh, north south transect of alpine sites across Quebec that didn't include Wapishka, but caught a bunch of other sites, and and especially looking for uh, 
uh, charcoal remnants in the soil, especially down at that organic soil, mineral soil interface. And actually the conclusion of that whole study, they were able to radiocarbon date the charcoal fragments then to, to figure out you know, when the fire that produced that charcoal happened. And their conclusion from that was that a lo actually a lot of the Quebec uh, alpine areas today were, were fire created in fact. By, they were forested, fire, massive fires came through, destroyed the, the forest canopy. And, and it's actually in a recovery process of, of closing back in over, or that's what they're inferring, over uh, longer time scales. Uh, although sometimes not that long. I was talking about this with Eric earlier. That some of them they think may have become uh, open as little as you know, 500 years ago or something like that. Um, so uh, there are studies of various kinds of you know, more esoteric little bits and clues that are hidden in a landscape like that. I'm not aware of the pollen stuff happening here. Uh, so, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. What's the resident bear population up there? Uh, they're there. Um, we did see a little bit of sign, uh, a little bit of scat, and actually on our on our on the trail out at lower elevation this last trip, nice big old bear tracks right in the mucky trail on our way out. Um, so we carried. Most of our food in, uh, in various types of bear resistant food containers, just as a safety precaution. Um, again, we didn't see any bears. We didn't have any problems. You know, other folks that have gone up there without uh, you know, bear resistant food containers and have had no problems. Uh, but again, camera trapping work by the Beyond Katahdin folks uh, definitely documented black bears up there using that habitat. Um, you know, population density or anything, I, I really don't know. But, but they're there. Yeah. Yeah. Just like they're in our alpine areas too here in New England. I mean, I was up in the Alpine Garden last, uh, last summer and this great big bear scat right out in the middle of the Alpine Garden, you know, full of, uh, full of alpine blueberries. So, yeah, they're up there. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Are there what are the blood sucking insects in the sense of what they feed on when people aren't around? <laughs> uh, I don't know. To toad blood, maybe? I, I, maybe they can suck on one another? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah it, it's one of the unfathomable things about the hordes of biting insects. Like, what do they do? I mean, there are other large animals, you know, bear, moose, caribou, you know, and then smaller animals. Uh, I'm not sure to what extent they can each use those other groups. Um, but somehow they keep reproducing. <laughs> uh, and uh, in terms of like uh, recreational use up here, I, I don't know good uh, numbers, but I think I've seen something like uh, 500 hikers a year, or something like that, in, in recent years. And things have been increasing. Um, I'm not totally sure how accurate that number is. But so I don't know. That, probably not enough to sustain all the biting insects. But <laughs> <laughs> we certainly fed them some. Well, do they, do they eat blood, or do they just use it to reproduce? Is that, it don't, just use it for laying their eggs. But their hmm. lifespan is so short that they reproduce yeah. so frequently. So yeah. It's, so they wouldn't, it wouldn't be like there's like this little Yeah, it may. Right. You know, I mean, their, their larvae are, are, you know, they're filter feeders, essentially aquatic. Uh, so that's, that's probably really their chief food source. Uh, and they only need an occasional blood meal to then make the next generation to keep it going. So, yeah. Can we give Matt one more round of applause? Or? Thank you. All right. Thank you.